للعالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين اللهم لك الحمد كله ولك الشكر كله وإليك يرجع الأمر كله على نيته وسره لك العتبة حتى ترضى ولا حول ولا قوة لنا إلا بك وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صفيه من خلقه وحبيبه بلغ رسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في الله حق الجهاد حتى أتاه اليقين اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على الحبيب المصطفى محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه ومن اهتدى بهديه وعمل بسنته إلى يوم الدين وارض عنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك أرحم الراحمين اللهم آمين I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, endless he is in his glory, the creator of heavens and earth, the provider, the cherisher, the sustainer. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the blessings that he has granted me and my loved ones. I express my gratitude to the Lord in words and action. I say alhamdulillah for blessings I know and blessings I know not. I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship save Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is Allah's final prophet and messenger, the bearer of glad tidings, the role model to be followed. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May the peace and the blessings of Allah be upon him and his family and his descendants, his companions and their followers, and all the righteous men and women that walk in the footsteps. And I ask Allah to make each and every one of us among them. Allahumma Ameen. My dear brothers and sisters, I greet you with the greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah ta'ala in, uh, in a few days, uh, the month of Jumada al-Thani will begin. And uh, as you must have noticed over the months, I always try to keep you reminded of our Islamic calendar and the months of our Islamic calendar, the events of our own history, uh, lest we get swept away in the postmodern secular existence in which we live. We always need to be reminded of who we are and what we belong to, our heritage, our civilization, the relevant events in our own calendar and our own history. You know, people are so quick to remember the Gregorian Western calendar, but if you ask them which Hijri year it is, most people don't even remember, let alone to remember the month. So the month of Jumad al-Thani uh, will start in a few days, inshallah. And if we say al-Thani, the second, it also means that there is al-Awwal, the first. So the, the month of Jumada al-Ula, al the first Jumada, uh, is, is almost over, and the second Jumada is going to start, the sixth month of the, of the Hijri calendar. Uh, and I wanted to make a couple of comments here that are very interesting. So Jumada in Arabic means, you know, something that is frozen, right? And so uh, this is probably a few hundred years, a couple hundred years before the Prophet when the Arabs, uh, you know, did not have particular names given to the months. And this was at the time of Kilab ibn Murrah, who was the fifth great-grandfather of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At his time, uh, they basically gave that particular month, those particular 30 days, they gave them the name Jumada al-Ula. And then the following 30 days, they gave them the name Jumada al-Thani, or Jumada al akhirah right? Why? Because it just happened that at that time, it was freezing cold. It was really, really cold, so they decided to call the first month Jumada al-Ula, you know, freezing cold, the first, and the second one became freezing cold, the second, right? Which almost reminds me, subhanAllah, of, you know, the weather these days, if you guys are following the news, you know, the Midwest, like Chicago, today the temperature in Chicago is lower than the tip of Mount Everest. Today, the temperature in Chicago is lower than Antarctica. This is not a joke. You know, I was in Minneapolis a couple of weeks ago, and the temperature was around zero Fahrenheit, which for me was the most excruciating experience in my life. Today, it's about minus 50, just so that you understand how low the temperature is. With wind chill, it's about, it's about minus 50. It feels like minus 50. You know, imagine the homeless in a city like that. Imagine just, you know, trying to get something done or going to the groceries. All the schools are shut down. You know, it's kind of like California, when it's 46 degrees, everyone stays at home and leaves. Or so cold, right? You haven't seen any cold. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be with people who are suffering 
such severe weather conditions right now as we speak. You know, it's interesting because The Economist actually ran an article this morning saying that with climate change, uh, there's going to be more and more severe weather events such as this in the Midwest and in other places. And it is saying that this is affecting, and I, I'm not sure if you've heard of this before, it is affecting the very population of Chicago. Like people are leaving the city of Chicago to other parts that I don't blame them. I don't, they need to move to either California or Florida, right? I, I honestly don't blame them. But the, 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 the population of the state of Illinois is declining because of, of the climate shift. It is affecting people's lives. And yet still some people deny the science behind climate change. But that, that's not our point. My point today, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about Jumada al-Thani. And, and, and it's not just about the cold, okay? There's something else that happened in that month that I want you to be reminded of. And that is the passing of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq uh, The Prophet's uh, greatest companion, his confidant, uh, the one that he was his friend, he was his brother, he was his father-in-law, the one that accompanied him along the journey of Hijrah, the one that became his successor, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. He passed away in the month of Jumada al thani which also means that his successor took over right after in the month of Jumad al Thani, right? And who was the successor of Abu Bakr al Siddiq? Umar ibn Khattab. Umar ibn Khattab, we also remember that. That's a good memory, right? That, that's a good thing to remember that Umar, that in the month of Jumad al Thani, we also remember that it is the month in which Umar ibn Khattab became the Khalifa of this Ummah, Al Faruq. The one who drew a clear line between what is righteous and what is evil. al faruq in whose character and resilience and tenacity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rendered aid to the entire ummah, to Islamic civilization as it were. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu who created the systems of governance, who created the administrative institutions that made you know, that nascent small power of Islam into a functional state. Umar ibn Khattab that trained standing armies according to modern standards. Umar ibn Khattab that created a navy. Umar ibn Khattab in whose time and under whose reign a postal service was created. Economic services such as writing checks were created under the, the reign of Umar ibn Khattab. You lived in, 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 in Iraq, for example, and you wrote a check that is notarized and honored by the government. This check can be cashed in North Africa. Two months later, something that the world, you know, in fact, the word check comes from the Arabic word sak, which means a promise to pay, a promissory note, essentially, that's what it is, right? Now, people can comfortably say that Muhammad وسلم, is the messenger of Allah, Khatam al Nabiyyin, right? He's a seal of prophets. And we can also say that Abu Bakr as Siddiq is the one that maintained the territorial integrity of the state. When he fought the secessionists, Harub al-Ridda, when they wanted to secede from the central government, he fought them in three difficult years. But the sentence will not be complete unless we say that Umar ibn al-Khattab is the political founder of the Islamic State as it is. He's the one that created the institutions that made Islam into an actual state with an actual government that is efficient, that has laws and rules. Umar ibn Khattab, that Umar, became the Khalifa in the month of Jumada al -Thani. Now, as the Khalifa, who is trying to fill in the shoes, pretty huge, big shoes of Abu Bakr al siddiq you have monumental challenges that you need to deal with at the time, right? Think about it. He needs to make peace within the state itself. You have all these other groups that wanted to secede, and he had to make peace with them and integrate them back into mainstream society. And he had to worry about two armies that are spread thin, you know, on the Persian frontier and on the, uh, the, the, the Syrian frontier as well. And he has enemies surrounding the, 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 the boundaries of the nation state that he needed to deal with. Not only that, Umar ibn Khattab had to deal with a new challenge that did not exist before. The influx of new cultures and new faiths and a lot of groups, minorities and majorities of people that are not Muslim. They don't speak Arabic. Now they're being integrated as citizens of the state. 
Their faith, their culture, their heritage must be respected. So Omar needed to create the political institutions and the judiciary institutions by which those provinces are governed effectively. But at the same time, there are laws and there are rules in which Sharia law will be implemented in an equitable fashion to protect the rights of both Muslim citizens and non-Muslim citizens. Massive, massive challenges. And right at home, Umar al-Khattab needed to deal with tens of thousands of Sahaba with different views and different opinions and different perspectives to maintain the institutions of knowledge to be viable, to be preserved, so that the very heartland of Islam is protected. Umar had to deal with economic challenges to make sure that there is enough revenue generated to maintain this growing state. Umar even needed to deal with something that is as simple as creating the Islamic calendar. Many people don't know that the Hijri calendar, starting from Muharram and ending with Dhul Hijjah, that was also instituted at the time. And the names existed from before, but the 12 year designation of the Islamic calendar also happened at the time of Umar ibn Khattab. So put yourself in his shoes. You're the Khalifa, and you assume responsibility, and you have the shoes of Abu Bakr to fill. And you have all these monumental challenges, right? And the clock is ticking. And now you are in power. What do you do? Which of these is a priority for you? Which one of these cultural, religious, political, military challenges, which one of these challenges I need to take on first? What Umar did was the absolute strangest thing ever. It left people confused for a very long time. Because his decision had nothing to do with any of these matters. The very first major decision Omar took after he became the Khalifa was to relieve from command Khalid ibn Walid. To remove the decorated army general, the chief of his army staff, the man under whose belt there is about a hundred battles that he won very successfully, that was loved by both civilians and soldiers alike, that instilled the fear of God in the hearts of his enemies. Khalid ibn al-Walid, his own cousin from the tribe of Adi. The very first decision Omar made was this risky decision, the removal of Khalid from command. <coughs> By every stretch of imagination, this was not a great decision to make. If we only utilize, you know, Western perspectives of rational choice theory and functionalism and self-preservation, what Omar did was not, a, was not a clever move. It was not an intelligent move. Because think about it. Why fix something that is not even broken? Khalid is an effective leader. He's already winning battles for you. Why remove him? He is your cousin. He comes from the same tribe. You can consolidate power together. And Adi takes over. Now why, why, why go bother by removing him and putting Abu Ubaidah, who comes from another tribe? Right? Why risk mutiny? He's loved by all the soldiers. He might organize the, a campaign and march on Medina and take over and become the Khalifa and install himself, as happened a thousand times before Amr bin Khattab. Or even if they don't organize a mutiny, at least it would basically affect the morale of the soldiers. Why take that risk? Why take the risk of emboldening the enemies of Islam when they know of that change of leadership and, and they might actually attack with more severity? Using rational considerations, what Umar did was not the right thing. And that is why all Western theories and Orientalist theories, even unfortunately -Muslim, some, some Muslims, all of their theories trying to understand why Umar did this completely fail. Why? Because, again, if we are talking about rationality, what Umar al Khattab did was not necessarily the most intelligent thing to do. It would have put him at risk. So they perpetuate very remarkable theories. They would say, well, Omar was just jealous of Khalid. Because Khalid was very successful. Or they would say that, uh, you know, something that was really, really weird when I read, that when they were kids, they were having a race, and Khalid won the race, and Omar was very upset about that. He held a grudge. So he waited for the right time, you know, to get back at Khalid and remove him from power just because he held a grudge. Do you, can you imagine Umar ibn Khattab acting on such impulse? Can you imagine a man like him acting on such impulse? Some other more reasonable academics would say, well, he was worried that Khalid is becoming a contender for power. 
he is becoming someone that is so loved and decorated and is being shined, maybe he will attack him and eventually take power from him. But when you think about it, what he did may have emboldened Khalid to, to do exactly that. That was not necessarily serving Omar's purpose if he, if he was worried about Khalid as a potential contender, right? Why did Umar ibn Khattab remove Khalid from his post and command with all the successes that he has achieved? And why is that important to talk about today? And what do we learn from this as a Muslim community and as a Muslim woman, right? I want you to listen to Umar's explanation himself. Don't take my word for it. When Umar asked about this, he said, Wallahi, lam a'zilu Khalida an khiyanatin al -sukht. I did not remove Khalid from, from his command because I was mad at him or because I was suspecting that he is, you know, organizing something sinister behind my back. It has nothing to do with وَإِنَّمَا عَزَلْتُ خَالِدًا لِأَنَّهُ فَتَنَ النَّاسِ Khalid became a fitna for people. وَأَرَدْتُ أَنْ يَعْلَمَ النَّاسُ أَنَّ الصَّانِعَ هُوَ اللَّهِ I wanted people to know that the maker and breaker, the producer of events and the giver of success and victory is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not a human being. <coughs> Try to understand the psychology of what was happening at the time. <coughs> Khalid, almost every battle he fought, he, was, he managed to win. He became a legend. He became a myth. People whispered his name. His soldiers only carried out missions knowing that Khalid was in charge. And when their officers asked them to go carry out missions, they would question them. Is Khalid aware of this? And if the answer is yes, they would go. They would throw themselves in the line of fire. And if they feel that Khalid may have not authorized the mission, they would hesitate. They started gradually attributing the, oh, their own success and their own victory, not to the divine plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but rather to the military brilliance of Khalid ibn Walid. Is that dangerous? It's extremely dangerous. And for an ummah that is building itself up, Umar ibn Khattab as a leader, not as a political leader, but as a spiritual leader. He needed to put this ummah on the right track so that it understands what its priorities are. So that it knows what needs to be done. So it's not swept away by secular interpretations and secular arguments, as we often do. You see someone who is clever, brilliant, charismatic, authoritative, right? And you think that things can only get done if that person is in charge. And when that person is in charge, we cannot go anywhere, we cannot achieve anything. Because success depends on human beings, it doesn't depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Umar wanted to completely abolish this notion. And I want you all to see, that's what he said, I want you all to see the great leader, Khalid bin Uli, I will remove him from power, and we will continue to become victorious. And he appoints his second in command, Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah. And the campaigns continued. Very successfully, nothing stopped, nothing was delayed. In a direct demonstration of the ayah in the Quran, in Surah Al-Fal, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ مَنْ نَصْرُ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ Isn't that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says? That victory comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Victory comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Triumph comes from Allah. And don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that human agency is not important. I'm not just suggesting that we all sit at home and do nothing and Allah will send them that victory. That, that's the exact opposite of what I'm saying. Human effort is important. Finding good leaders with good vision who are tenacious and resilient is important. Right? Finding people who, are, who have skills and talented that will get the job done is extremely important. Right? But thinking that that is all I need for victory is against the teachings of Islam. Because there are two extremes. There are those who think that I just need to make dua and Allah will take care of it. And then the other extreme, oh, I need to find the right people to do it. And that's all I need. What Umar al Khattab was teaching us is that it's a combination of both. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you if you organize well. But your good organization is not enough to give you victory. That's the lesson that we are supposed to learn today. And as the community grows, our own Muslim community, and as it grows in its own institutions, in its own reach, in its own resources, we need to be thinking about those things. What is our perception of leadership? What is our perception of success? What is our perception of victory? What does it take to become successful and victorious? 
eloquent speakers who have good command of English and good charisma, that's all we need? Absolutely wrong. Find the good leaders, but always make sure that in your heart you know that success and victory will come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what we're learning here, brothers and sisters. That is what we're learning here. But I wanted to argue this. What is even more remarkable in this story than the decision of Umar ibn Khattab is how Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah handled it. Because again, I just said that the human factor is, is still very important. Abu Ubaidah, if this was just an ordinary man who was driven by self-interest, once he received the news, he should have immediately relieved Khalid from command and assumed those powers himself. But what does he do? He examines the landscape. He observes the situation. What are we doing here? We are in a, in a military campaign. We are laying the city of Damascus under siege. Khalid is in the middle of battle. If I go right now and I relieve him from command, it might affect him, he might take it personally, it might affect the army and the soldiers, it might affect morale, I need to wait. I needed to wait. He was not disobeying the command of the Khalifa, but he was not being a blind follower either. Right? The will of Umar ibn Khattab will come to pass, but I will carry it out with wisdom. I will carry it out with wisdom, and I will choose the right time and the right circumstances. Right? So he waits for a few days until the campaign is over. Right? And then after that, he brings some of his close confidants, including Mu'adh ibn Jabal and others, and he starts telling them and showing them the letter of Umar ibn Khattab. He doesn't go directly to Khalid ibn Yuri. Why? Because he felt that he has a bit of a conflict of interest here. Not only that I'm informing Khalid that he's being relieved from command, I'm also telling him that I am your replacement. That's a conflict of interest. I didn't want to be in that position. I want him to learn from somebody else. So Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he goes and he very, very nicely and very, very calmly, he informs Khalid Nurid of the decision. And what does Khalid do? Khalid comes back with a big smile on his face and he walks into the tent of Abu Ubaidah. And he says to him, Ghafar Allahu laka ya Abu Ubaidah. May Allah forgive you Abu Ubaidah. We're friends, man. We're brothers. You don't hide this from me. May Allah forgive you. You receive a letter from the commander of the faithful that you are now in charge and you don't tell me about it? What are you scared of? Why, why did you hesitate? I thought we're friends. You come talk to me right away. If Umar ibn Khattab thinks you're better, then that means you're better. And I will listen and obey. You, you follow me in prayer and you let me lead you as the Imam when you are supposed to be our leader and our Imam. Why do you do that? And Abu Ubaid al Jarrah stood up and hugged him and he said, I honor you. And it is through you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put fear in the hearts of our enemies. And if it's up to me, I don't like this decision, but this is the will of the Khalifa. And his will will come to pass. I am I'm glad and thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you took it so well. Of course, you have some weaker narrations that say that Khalid was very upset about this and stuff like that. And, you know, again, the pattern of history tells us that this is not true. The insight of history tells us that the Sahaba of Muhammad Sallallahu were not like that. And what even proves this point further is that Khalid Nuri stepped down and he became an ordinary officer in the army. Let me ask you a question. If Umar really was frightened of Khalid as a potential threat. Would he have relieved him from command and then just let him be with the army as an average officer? What was the safest course? Is to probably summon him to Medina, right? And I don't know, put him in prison or make him the governor of Yemen or something, right? Give him something else, keep him busy, put him away. As far from the army as possible. If she's so popular, take him away from his popularity. But what does he do? Khalid is to be relieved from command and just to become an army officer just like everybody else. Leave them in the middle of all of that. SubhanAllah. And Khalid steps down, and again, that's my third point, is how remarkable and beautiful the response of Khalid ibn Walid was. And what is it that we learn from them? He steps down from being the commander of the army to being an average soldier. A few days later, Abu Ubaid ibn Zarah actually gave him some type of special operations mission to fulfill with a, with a small battalion of soldiers, and that's it. 
from sitting you know, on those big tables with big maps, looking at big armies and, and intercontinental politics, to being a simple soldier that takes a group of other soldiers and they go carry out a mission and come back and report to command. That's it. In a second. In a second. What do we learn from this? I've been doing Islamic work for close to 20 years and I've seen it time and time again. It's not very common, but it happens in our community. I talk to some brothers or some sisters and I need their help. You know, can you help with this? Can you help uh, cleaning the masjid? Can you help organizing the furniture? Uh, it's beneath me. I mean, they don't know, they don't say it's beneath me, right? But they just try to wiggle out of it. I don't do these small time things. You know, uh, cleaning the carpet or moving the carpet or, you know, helping with the homeless or, you know, just the stuff that we do at the masjid on the day-to-day, -day, making copies, helping the students, you know, in a small halaqa, you know, that only three or four people will see you and say thank you, right? Uh, I'm not interested. It's beneath me. But the minute we tell that person, I want you to sit on this board or to become the chairperson of that committee or attend this press conference, and everyone puts on their nice suits and they come in and they want to be as close to the camera as possible. As long as there's a camera and there's a microphone, everyone is going to be in the forefront. But when Allah's work needs to be done away from the spotlight, some people just hesitate. Khalid Murid, as a commander, he did his utmost best. Khalid Murid, as a soldier, he did his utmost best. It did not matter what position he had and it did not matter what kind of spotlight was given to him. Didn't matter. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you right now, wallahi, our Muslim community is carried upon the shoulders of people, not, like, not people like me, not those who stand behind the microphones and speak in public. Don't let the images fool you. Our Muslim community is carried upon the shoulders of the anonymous brothers and sisters that do Allah's work and wait for absolutely no reward or compensation whatsoever. The scores of people that do the blessings of our community, and you don't even know their names. And you never will. You never will. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can reward those people. As the Prophet taught us, <laughs> Those righteous, anonymous, unassuming, simple people, their hair is not tidy, their clothes are not fancy. If they are in the room, you don't notice them. And if they disappear from the room, you won't miss them. Right? But they carry so much weight with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they take an oath, Allah will fulfill their oath. If they take an oath, Allah will fulfill their oath. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the people that carry communities further. These are the people that, that drive and propagate communities further. Right? Leadership is important. And that's, again, see the balance? That's what I'm saying. Leadership is extremely important. And the thing is, not only that some of these people, they shy away from what they consider to be beneath them, the lowly activities and tasks of our community, and all they want is to just vie for leadership power, and they want to be on the board, and they want to be in this position, and that position, right? Even, even when they don't bring anything to the table, right? It's just the desire, that lust for power, which I understand, okay? I understand. This is a human weakness. The Prophet taught us, The very last vice to be removed from the heart, hearts of the righteous is the lust for power. I get it. Okay? But what I don't get is that when you don't have your way, when you don't have your way, when you don't get the, the leadership position and the limelight that you were looking for, right? Some of these people, they don't just walk away. They try to assassinate the character of others. They attack them, and they try to find flaws in their personalities, and they try to show others that they're not qualified, and they attack their reputations, and they attack their families. I've seen it time and time again. And when they can't find anything to say, they start attacking their associations. They start saying, oh, you know, this brother that you elected for the board, his wife is not even hijabi. Have you heard that before? They will find a way to bring you down. They will find a way to bring you down. And I, and I don't understand why we do this sometimes. Alhamdulillah, you know, it's still, it's not a common pattern in our community. Our community is very healthy, alhamdulillah. Our community is very healthy. But these are the things that hold us back when they happen, okay? And I have a very simple remedy, by the way, for you. A very simple remedy. I can read you books about the diseases of the hearts and all of that, okay? But I have a very simple remedy, and that is know your vision. 
Know what you want as a Muslim, right? You're a religious Muslim, you come to the masjid, you're righteous, right? Know what you want for yourself and for your family and for your community. What is your vision? What do you want to achieve in this life? Do you want, it, it, when you are 65 years old and I ask you, what have you achieved with your life? And you say, I worked and I made money. Well, you know, join the club, just like the rest of all human beings. You've done nothing. If that's all you could come up with about your legacy, that you've had a stable job and you've made money, you've achieved nothing. Nothing. But if you can know what your vision is as a Muslim in this world for you and for your family and for your community, I want to see my community come this far. I want to see our institutions come that far. I want to see my children, you know, become this religious. I want to see my masjid become this beautiful. I want to see wider society at that level of acceptance of Islam. You have to have a vision for yourself and for your family and for your community. And when you know what that vision is, ask yourself, is there anyone in my community, any masjid or any institution that is working on that vision? And if the answer is yes, my advice to you, go and give them a hand. Don't worry about leadership. Go and give them a hand. Become this beautiful, anonymous person that just supports. And earn the pleasure of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala that way. If you cannot find an existing leader or institution or masjid or organization that is working on that vision, my advice to you, go create something. Go create something from scratch that will fill that need in our own community and then inspire others to help you. This way, every single one of us is busy doing something good. <laughs> but what happens is that I have a certain vision and then I go to a masjid that supports that vision. And instead of actually helping them carry out the vision that I support, that brought me here in the first place, I start making issues and, and act like termite. You know what termites do? They eat down the walls and the structures of buildings. Every community has those little termites. And, and, and all it takes is just a couple of termites to bring a community down to its knees. I have seen communities destroyed to smithereens because of people like this. Because they lost track of their vision and what they want in this world. You join the place because you support what they do. Be a part of it. Support them. Give them a hand. Now, leader, bad leadership needs to be fixed and advised. <laughs> Evil leadership needs to be removed. I'm making no mistake about this. Leaders who commit evil acts and, and, and you know, immoral acts and acts that are against Islam, we must do everything in our capacity to remove them from their position. But leaders that make mistakes, you know, mistakes of judgment, not mistakes of integrity, I need to find a way to help them and be with them and have their backs. Otherwise, we're constantly stepping on each other and stampeding upon each other and we grow none as a community. And we move forward none as a community. And we continue to be weak. <laughs> we're not able to make da'wah. We're not able to take care of, of the weak and lost and, and forgotten among us. We're not able to take care of the youth that are renouncing Islam. We're not able to repel the evils of Islamophobia. We're, we're achieving nothing. We're just standing still as a community. Khalid ibn al-Walid was here and eventually he was there and it did not matter to him. Because what mattered to him eventually is that I know my vision. My vision is that my ummah grows. And if somebody else achieves that vision, I'll give him a hand. It doesn't matter. I don't have to be the one in charge. That is what the Prophet ultimately taught us. And remember this hadith and let me end with this. And this is a sahih muttafaqun alayhi accepted in all books of hadith. Hadith of Abdul Rahman ibn Sumrah came to the Prophet ﷺ and asked him for a position of leadership. And what does the Prophet say What does the Prophet say to him sallallahu Do not request a position of leadership. When you take a position of leadership because you requested it, you will get no help from Allah. It is just you and that position. You have to deal with it on your own. Use your own resources. And when you are blessed with a position of leadership without requesting it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes your partner. And He's the one that's going to give you a hand. Start from the ranks and make your way up. Volunteer by sweeping the carpet and, and fixing the bathrooms. 
and helping the children on Sunday schools and build yourself up. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala feels that you are qualified, you know, there's always room for talented people to lead. Our community needs leaders. But sometimes somebody comes from out of nowhere and they just they want to jump on the board right away. It could happen. There's a process for these things to happen. But one, are you going to be happy and satisfied? Two, are you going to be able to carry out your vision? Three, is your community going to move forward or not? And if the answer is yes, God bless you. But if you're not sure about the answer, then you need to take it easy and, and learn and, and adjust your knee and adjust your intention and ask yourself who you are and what you're coming from and what you're trying to achieve. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us our sins and to establish us firmly on His path. Brothers and sisters, raise your hands and speak to Allah from the heart. من يهدي الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له ولي مرشدا وصلي وسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين طاهد الغر الميامين محمد الصامت الوعد الأمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وارضعنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك رحمة الرحيم اللهم آمين My dear brothers and sisters on the occasion of the month of Jumada الثاني I reminded you that this is a month in which Umar ibn al-Khattab became the Khalifa. And the uh, first major decision he made was to relieve from power his decorated chief of, of staff of the army, Khalid ibn Walid, the great general, with all the successes under his belt. But the first just decision that, that he made that was super risky, was you know by every stretch of human imagination and rationality was very risky. He removed Khalid from his command and made him into just an ordinary officer in the military. And I said that what Umar wanted to teach the Ummah and to teach us is that success depends on not only the effort of human beings, which is important, but it primarily depends on the intervention of the Divine, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you think for a second that clever, smart, charismatic leaders are the ones that will bring us success, you're absolutely wrong. While that is a prerequisite, but without the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, none of it can happen. It's got to be both, right? And we talked a little bit about the idea of leadership and what it means today for our community. But I wanted to also remind you that the backdrop against which I am telling you all these stories is the fact that in 2019, again, and I keep reminding you of this, you know, our staff and our imams chose that the theme of this year is going to be beauty. Inspired by the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu when he said, Allah Jamilun Yuhibbul Jamal. Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. Beauty of the heart, beauty of the mind, of the words, of our choices, our actions, how we treat each other, and the beauty of how we progress forward and move forward as a community. And I wanted to highlight this beautiful decision you know, that could otherwise be understood wrong by others, by Orientalists. But essentially, it's a beautiful decision that, that set, sets the, rock, the, the record straight that Umar ibn Khattab made. A decision that is about integrity, is about, is about principle and value. It's about unity and bringing a community together. It's about what the priorities are. And I want you to be reminded of that, inshallah, as our community grows. And as the challenges grow for our community, understand that beauty and try to live by that code. And ask yourself, my actions and my slander and my, my backbiting and my, you know, criticism and all of these things, is this making my community beautiful or not? And if the answer is no, then okay. It's a valid point, but I need to find a different way to bring it across. I need to find a different way to, to bring my feedback across. I need to find a different way to help my masjid and my community move forward and grow, right? Beauty should be the criterion. And I wanted to go back to Khalid in the way. Because Khalid was, you know, at one of those meetings and, you know, when he was about to retire from the army, they had some sort of a gathering to honor him. And a man basically stood up and said, you know, Ya Khalid, nahl fitna. Don't worry about it, we got your back. We don't like what Umar did. And whatever you ask of us, we're here for you. You want us to, you know, organize a mutiny for you? We will be mutinous. And what does Khalid say? Fitna wa Umar. Fitna, when Umar is still around, it's impossible. See how much trust 
how much trust he has, right? Again, the human factor is still very important. I'm not dismissing it. If it wasn't for Omar, many of these things wouldn't have happened. But in our minds, in our hearts, we need to understand the balance between the human effort and divine effort. It has to be both. And I gotta do both. Exhaust the means until the very end, every means at my disposal. And lay my prayer rug and turn my face to Allah and say, Allah, without you, I cannot win. Nothing is gonna happen. Nothing is gonna be achieved, right? It cannot be one at the expense of the other. Now, later on, Khalid came back to Medina after he retired. And Umar wanted to make sure that the air between them is clear. So he visits them at his house and they talk a little bit, right? And after the meeting was over, Khalid bin Walid actually made Umar the custodian of his own wasiyah, of his own will. Meaning that Umar is the one that has to carry out Khalid's will in the event of Khalid's death. So much he trusted him. And he actually known to have been said, Ibn Asakir actually narrates this story. It is said that Khalid bin Walid mentioned you know, in, in a private conversation once, Wallahi, inna Aba Bakrin ahabbu ilayya min Umar. Abu Bakr is more beloved to me than Umar. This is the truth, right? Even though Umar is his cousin from the same family, but he loved Abu Bakr more. Al an, waqad walla Allahu azza wa jalla Umar fa inni ahmad Allah an awrathani hubba. Now that Allah made Umar the leader, I am thankful to Allah that He put His love in my heart. Not just the obedience of Umar, but the love of Umar as well. You know, it, it, and I'm sure that Khalid was a human being at the end of the day. I'm sure there was a bit of a pinch in his heart. It is normal for you to feel negative. But you have to look at your actions. And maybe time will help you heal. But when you act on impulse, that's when catastrophes take place. Right? It was, it was mentioned here and there in the books of history that Khalid may have been a little bit disappointed at the decision of relieving him from Kamehameha, right? But he never acted upon that. If, if it's true, he never acted upon it. He kept it to himself, and he may have articulated it here and there a little bit, because he's a human being at the end of the day, right? Now Khalid is on his deathbed, and he knew that this is, the, this is it, he's dying. And what does he say? Now, if you go to today in the city of Homs in Syria, there is a masjid that is named Khalid Murid. A lot of people say that he's buried in that masjid, even though other narrations suggest that he's buried in Medina. But the point is there's a big plaque on the masjid. Parts of it were, were destroyed in the civil war. There's a big plaque that actually has the very last statement that Khalid Murid said before he died. Right? What does he say? I just want you to pay attention to what he's regretting. These are the most truthful words that will come out of man's mouth when he knows that he's about to die. Right? Shahidtu mi'ata zahfin aw zuha'uha, he says. I was a witness to over a hundred campaigns, a hundred military campaigns. Shahidtu mi'ata zahfin aw zuha'uha. Wa ma fi jasadi min shibrin illa wa fihi darbatu sayfin. Aw ta'natu sahmin. Aw darbatu rumhin. Wa ha ana dha amutu ala sariri. Hatfa anfi. Ka mawti al-ba'ir. There isn't a single inch in my body that is not injured by either a strike of a sword or an arrow or a spear. Every single inch of my body is injured and here I am. I die in my own bed like an animal. May the eyes of those cowards who missed me, who couldn't give me a clean, honorable death, a soldier's death, may their eyes never rest or sleep. May they be shamed and disgraced for the rest of, of, their, of their days. See, that's his dua. He's upset that he's dying this average death on his bed and he did not die as a shaheed, fighting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when he passed away, the women of, of Medina cried and wailed, which was a practice that stopped from the Prophet's time. You know, they stopped doing that. And you would think that Umar would be the most strict about it. So for the first time in years, People start hearing women mourn and wail and, and, and cry loudly. So some of the companions came to Umar al-Khattab and told him, Ya Amir al-Munin, should we stop these women? And what does he say? What does he say, Umar al-Khattab, about Khalid al -Nuri? Wallahi, Wallahi, laha ulai yabkina mawta Aba Sulaiman. Those women are crying because Abu Sulaiman Khalid al -Nuri passed away. وَلِمِثْلِهِ فَلْتَبْكِ الْبَوَاكِ 
It is for people like Khalid ibn Walid that women mourn, that women cry and weep. Let them cry. They deserve to cry for him, and he deserves to be mourned by them. And he did not interfere. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us our sins and to establish us firmly on his path. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to unify our hearts, to unify our community. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our differences and disagreements that of diversity that will only enrich our community and strengthen us and not to unite us and sow the seeds of strife among us. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to unite our hearts on one goal, to help us move forward as a community. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us cast our disagreements and differences aside and collaborate with each other for the sake of our deen, our dunya, and our akhirah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen our brotherhood and sisterhood. And I ask Allah to give us success in this life and the next. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this day to cleanse our hearts from envy and hatred. And I ask Allah to replace that with empathy, compassion, and love. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this beautiful day to strengthen our brothers and sisters that suffer from extreme and severe weather conditions all over the world. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen our brothers and sisters that suffer from tyranny, from poverty, and from any other ailments. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as you brought us here in this shape and form with these hearts, to establish us firmly on the Day of Judgment and to admit us to Jannah in the company of Muhammad sallallahu اللهم انصرنا على انفسنا وعلى شياطين الانس والجن برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين اللهم احفظ شبابنا وبناتنا واحفظ ازواجنا وزوجاتنا اللهم احفظ امهاتنا امهاتنا وابائنا اللهم احفظ اخواننا ومن لهم كان ومن كان لهم فضل علينا اللهم يا ربنا ثبت على الحق اقدامنا اللهم وادخلنا الجنة في زورة الحبيب المصطفى العدنان برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات المسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم الأموات إنك السميع القريب المجيب دعوات رب العالمين وأقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت صلاة المؤمنين في